So uh, I will make this very brief introduction and I'll let be asked to do that because uh, um, Luis Fernandez Galeano is probably well known to many of you. He is the editor of the magazine Architectura Viva and the magazine A and B. And I have a latest copy of Architectura Viva. And I, I, uh, um, I think that uh, um, he is also an architect, of course, and, and uh, teaches in the uh, Madrid uh, uh, School of Architecture, and is uh, author of uh, a number of books and is a, a regular contributor to the, uh, the main Spanish newspaper, El País. Uh, his uh, most recent book, uh, so far I don't think it's translated into English, called Fire and Memory, and is a, a kind of disquisition on architecture and energy, <coughs> I hope will soon be translated, it was uh, uh, published in 1991. But the, the most important uh, thing I, I for me, is, is this enormous contribution as uh, an editor of a very uh, uh, engaged uh, <coughs> magazine. I, I was talking to him uh, earlier this evening about uh, the magazines in the world that one can think of as being really engaged and continuously engaged in what <coughs> Tony Hansberg referred to earlier today as a debate on architecture. But I think in a way which uh, is also at the same time uh, very seriously and kind of into practice. So that I think uh, one can think of uh, his magazine as a magazine of theoretical discourse, critical discourse, but always with emphasis on practice. And then I think it's great virtues. And for that, I agree with Luis and I was going Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody, for being here at such a late time of the night. Last week I lectured in Zurich at 8 o'clock in the morning and I said this won't happen to me again. <laughs> but I couldn't ever dream that I could be lecturing 10 o'clock at night here in Amsterdam. Still, uh, I have been adequately uh, lectured by our organizers that uh, Dutch audiences are uh, sufficiently masochistic as to undertake some uh, small doses of self-inflicted pain. And I'll be uh, careful not to um, give you too great doses. Uh, the organizers um, have um, put us in the Hotel Ambassade that some of you may know. But of those of you who do not know it, if you look at this uh, card with which the, the hotel makes itself known, you will readily see from the blue color that uh, it has taken 10 houses in one of the canals and made the inside of these houses into a hotel. And I thought that this hotel ambassade where we are all happily living during our week here would be a very good metaphor for the theme of the course. When I received the first, uh, uh, the first papers, they said, dwelling form, urban fragment, image context. I, I couldn't make quite clear what was going on. And I, I frankly confessed some measure of uh, puzzle. I said, what is really on? Later on, I think uh, I was more or less uh, brief that it was going to be on housing. So things uh, seemed to, to make themselves clear. But um, I understood from the um, original presentation by Ken that it was going to be on housing with, uh, with a critical touch, with a critical flavor. So I have prepared a lecture with some sort of critical flavor at the beginning, at the end, and some cheese inside. Uh, the cheese in the sandwich is basically a Spanish housing architecture from the Second World War some selected projects which we are going to go through very quickly, and I have put some bread at the beginning and the end. But when I said that uh, this uh, Hotel Ambassade was a good metaphor 
It was because it, was pre it presented in a residential architecture, not properly housing architecture, but residential nonetheless, the very themes we are going to be discussing here this week. A theme that uh, Herzberger presented this morning when he said, why is that that the architecture that architects like is not the architecture that people like? Why has this happened? How come that we are so far apart from popular wishes? And this is what has been happening from the, at least in architectural uh, criticism uh, since the 60s and since pop. And um, this hotel to me, I think, uh, in, in, in the image of the private for something that was eminently public, the image of fragmentation of something that was a whole, a coherent, a single enterprise administered by a single company, I think uh, presented very well the themes we are going to be discussing. To me, it was the ultimate theme park. And ultimate because it was genuine. Some of you probably have read in the papers that the Japanese have created a huge uh, uh, Dutch theme park. You may have read about it. It's huge, and you can go to uh, Holland and visit Holland without coming here. But our hotel, I think, is even more precisely thematic in that it uh, combines privacy and publicity. This is the private realm, and at the same time, the public role with such, I think, coherence that it should be uh, taken I think, as the symbol of our discussions and as, as an image that may illuminate some of the things we are going to uh, go on. Herzberger said, well, it is true that today public housing architecture is sort of diminishing and spearing out. So every more and more public architecture or architect, sort of housing architecture has become something that has to do with the market. And of course, the market is uh, basically uh, audience meters and, and, and the acceptance polls. And most of us architects seem to feel a slight discomfort when we are faced with people who are measuring acceptance, pleasure, feeling of uh, easiness, what would we deliver? I think this is uh, an attitude that we must changed if architecture is going to survive as a profession of service. I think that measuring what people want is not something that should be dismissed as something that is market-wise. Of course, has, it has to do with housing or architecture becoming a commodity. But it has to do also with architecture being something that is offering services which are readily accepted or directly refused. And of course, this divorce between the architecture, architecture and the public, between the architect and the user, has to do with deals of modernity, has to do with the fact that reason is in trouble. Reason has been indeed trouble for most of the century, and uh, we have realized in the last 30 years, and we are trying to come to terms to the fact that reason is in trouble, but we are not prepared to um, renounce the rational organization of human affairs. I, I want to show some slides to begin with that may, may, may give you this, this, this kind of uh, uh, mm, tremendous dilemma that we are very often faced with um, and has to do with the figuration and with uh, the picturesque with romantic architecture coming to the fore, coming to the, the foreground. After all, postmodernism ha had to do not only with using classical um, words or classical vocabulary, postmodernism in its very different versions had to do with architecture as meaning, with figuration, the ability of architecture to communicate through images, and had to do with the picturesque. The last 30 years, I think we have seen the debate of the picturesque coming to the foreground, and the debate on the picturesque as something we should be somehow opposed or, 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 or presented as different, and, and, and on the other side to what we, call, what we could say reason or uh, the geometry that we are architects are more familiar with. Uh, the first image, of course, could, could confront one of those uh, 
a straight a, a street uh, frontages in, 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 in Amsterdam with, with uh, the famous uh, Rue de Rivoli, the Percier and La Fontaine uh, drawing, because I think it shows very well this contrast between reason and feeling, or with, reason, uh, say, rational architecture and the picturesque. But of course, um, this has also been... Now, I must deliver, I, I must uh, perfection a system of signs with our colleague there, who is chasing the slides. But this hasn't been perfected yet, so he doesn't recognize my signs yet. Okay, <laughs> now there we go. <laughs> I said that um, this opposition between rational in inverted commas and picturesque well, is something that has been talked about since the 60s. In fact, this comes from the first issue of Espacio Societa, and it was uh, uh, Habraken going about his things, about how, how buildings in the 50s were sort of uh, uh, straight, and in the 60s everything looked shaked. And uh, of course, uh, we have shaked things everywhere, and we have shaked plans to give some excitement, some, some, some kind of picturesque uh, capacity, so that we could reconcile, we could bridge over this great divide between the architect and the public. So we have shaked things. We have shaked things, and we have shaked even. The, the rational, tectonic, uh, uh, say, basis of architecture. And we have pushed things to such extremes that, uh, l let me, if, if you now see my sign, okay, yes. <laughs> to such extremes as this one, which is a tremendous catastrophe that happened to Enrique Miralles, an architect who's been here uh, uh, not very long ago. Enrique was building a big sports palace in Huesca. And of course, as most of his architecture was atectonic to the extreme, everything was done in a more difficult way, in a more uh, um, theatrical and picturesque way. And uh, uh, one night, uh, four o'clock in the morning, the whole thing collapsed, as you can see in this newspaper clipping in the uh, right. So it was deconstructed architecture taken to the very extremes and <laughs> Without making jokes, I think a, po a kind of poetical justice that was inflicted on this architecture by this tectonic reason. Of course, Ken, when, when, when he wrote this, this, this thing about the, the, this uh, masterclass, what are we going to, to, to deal with? Uh, he, he put the word fragment, tricky word. Because fragment has to do with, uh, not only with the fragmentary condition of uh, the modern man, of modernity, but it has to do also with, uh, with, I think you can see very well in these opposing images. The man on the left understood in this uh, anatomical uh, image as a system in which every muscle is connected to another one. So an organic totality is um, presented as a system in which you cannot take any part of it because it will collapse. Whereas in this Magritte picture you see how much more attractive it is to look at things in fragments. This woman who has her body painted in five different fragments leads your attention towards her knees, her breasts. She, she focuses you onto parts of her anatomy and she's being, through hiding, much more glamorous. Fragment is something very glamorous. Architecture magazines normally produce this kind of, of intellectual operation. They select fragments which they print and whenever you print fragments, you can select the best fragments. And you can present things in a way that uh, I think are not always understood. I think that fragment and the fragmentary condition of uh, architecture is something that we must be very aware of. I think it's part of our time, but it is not something we must celebrate. Fragment is something that is very often a, a condition 
of incompleteness that I think architecture should fight against and should understand as a pathology. Of course, this perverse look, the dark shadow that you can see in these surrealistic images, is sometimes in this overheated intellectual climate more attractive than the anatomical image of the system. But I do not doubt that this is the man on the left and not the woman on the right, the image we would prefer for our architecture to uphold. And of course, the problem, after all that, goes back, as Ken was saying this morning, in the eye, in the dominance of vision. In this dominance of vision, which is also the dominance of geometry that you can see in these images. The inner grid, which constructs architecture, and at the same time, the perceptual grid through which we capture it. Architecture has been so dominated by the eye, has been so much under the dictatorship of the eye that, of course, any discourse that hopes to reconstruct the totality of architecture must begin by denying the dominance of the eye. Not the existence of the eye. We need vision. Architecture is also a visual phenomena. But the eye, understood as the only criterion of truth, of, of pertinence in architecture is going to lead us astray. Of course, the eye the eye can be understood in many ways. The eye of God. Also the eye of reason. The eye of Galileo measuring the mountains and the moon. The eye is not necessarily something mythical. It can be also something associated with scientific knowledge. You can see the modern architecture, how the, modern, how the eye has been dominant in these two images of Le Corbusier when he goes to see the site for his uh, mother house. And he says, uh, when he finds the place, when he discovers it, and then he, he, he draws this huge eye on the terrain as a footprint, saying, this is it, it's mine, as he was sort of marking the place, marking the boundaries through the eye. When he draws L'Unité d'Habitation and so many other projects, there is the ubiquitous eye saying, my relationship with nature, my relationship with the exterior is through the eye. Greenery, sun, the wind, space, all of this I capture through the eye. But the rest of the senses are denied. This modern architecture takes the eye as the main way of relating itself to the exterior world. And of course, the eye is also the dominant uh, strength, the dominant strain of uh, contemporary art. You see, in this uh, vision of the, the field of vision as a totality, this, this, this wish to, to um, undertake the whole of uh, our environment under the command of the eye, or at the left, the famous Ziga Vertov eye inside the lens, the mechanical vision of uh, contemporary expression which we are looking at here, and which is continuously sort of persecuting us and vigilating us. But this eye, this eye of God, this eye of the scientist, this eye of the modern artist through which it relates to the exterior world, has two different versions. And I think that both have to be inserted in architecture. On the left, of course, Le Doux, Théâtre de Besançon, the, this image of the eye as something that uh, is only able to capture frozen geometry. And uh, on the right, Magritte, 
This eye which shows a piece of sky with clouds passing. This eye which uh, is not focused on the object, but focused on the process. The eye of the object and the eye of the process, I think, must be both reconciled in architecture. Something happened, but n never worry. And this is the, the process, the process uh, got stopped, but we'll go over it. So, I want you to see in the coming uh, slides, if things uh, get sorted out in this model process, how we should reconcile the object and the process. We should reconcile the present and the tissue. We should reconcile building and weaving. And how we are going to do it and how we can reflect upon them, just taking as we were asked to, some examples of contemporary Spanish housing architecture. And now, if our um, colleagues in the technical uh, department uh, manage to get things going, I'll speak with the slides, and if not, you'll have to reconstruct them with the imagination side, which is the more creative of them all. Dramatic pause <laughs> to give them some time, but they don't. They need some, some more. Anyway, I tried now to present some um, images of Spanish architecture from the Second World War. I have selected two projects from the 50s, two from the 60s, four from the 70s, and four from the 80s, and two from, two from the 90s, through which I, I would. Uh, hoped to go speedily. Speedily. <laughs> but of course, there was only a wish. If it's ready, let's have them. OK. To begin with, uh, this is, of course, Coderc, house in the Barceloneta. I'll, 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 you, you may try to focus them without my telling you to focus them. OK? And. Uh, you, you can see that this, this, this Coder thing, which the sort of the folded planes comment and, and, and stress the urban tissue, the urban uh, trauma in which it is inserted, but which is not separated from it. And the, the second one I wanted to show, also from the 50s, this is the, uh, as you can see, just, just uh, it, it, it uh, prolongs and slightly stresses the existing fabric of the town, and in a different, uh, uh, that's right, in a different one, which I wanted to show also from the 50s, the first one was Coderc in Barcelona, this is Vázquez de Castro, Caño Roto in Madrid, two very different things, the first one was private housing, um, this is public housing, and this is understood as a big sort of, uh, you said, Heidelberger said this morning, Kashva. well, sort of, this sort of uh, tapestry, this carpet, of patio housing which creates a new urban tissue and in which architecture is understood in both cases as something that has to produce, has to create urban tissue. Either has a urban tissue in which it, it, it inserts itself and which upon it perhaps uh, commence but which it develops or else creates a completely new urban tissue. Both were from the 50s and both I think represent well the promise of modernity. The 60s were different. The 60s, which we are going to see with two. Uh, that's right. The 60s were different because the 60s were the times of, uh, uh, in Spain, was the first economic boom for uh, ready money. And the housing, both private and public, was understood as a formal gesture. And this housing as as, 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 as a wave of relations, this housing weaved has become housing built as fortresses, as images that can be powerful 
And remember, this is in Madrid, San Dioiza, this uh, uh, reinforced concrete sculptural tower at the entrance of the town. And now, in Barcelona, you have uh, Wallens 7 by uh, the then very young uh, Ricardo Bofill, um, that if the first Oiza was housing for middle class um, um, enriched the bourgeoisie, this, on the other hand, was for the not so rich but rather sophisticated sons of this bourgeois that made this world in kind of, uh, of, uh, of a hippie commune of, of uh, 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 rather expensive means. So in both cases, both from the more conservative point of view, this uh, Torres Blancas built for, for, for a, a, a very important uh, builder that would get, wanted to create a monument to his, to his memory. And in this case, this, this Walden 7, created by a young architect who was as radical in his political views as his in aesthetic preferences, both, in both cases, housing is understood. Not in the 50s, as a weave of relations, as a human tissue, but rather as fortresses, as monuments, as something isolated that can be remembered and that can be uh, made popular through its own image. Now, two projects from the 70s. Or rather, four. For I'll begin with this one, which has been mentioned upon this uh, kidney shaped courtyard in the urban tissue of Seville by architects Cruz and Ortiz, in which you can see how the urban tissue of, the ta of, 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 of Seville, so, so dense, so compact, is perforated with this gesture of freedom, which is this kidney shaped courtyard. So it's contextual on the one hand and a sign of, 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 of freedom and, and, of, um, and, 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 and of hope and of promise at the other. This, this uh, expression in the, in the early 70s, you know that Franco <coughs> died by then, and then there was a sort of a, a sense of, of, of uh, um, exaltation and, and, of, and of newly recovered uh, freedom in Spanish society, was also expressed in many uh, uh, housing uh, schemes like this one in Madrid by Bayon and, and, and Naroca in which the, the, the owners uh, design each of them their own facades by, by the, uh, accepting, as in the other case, the patio courtyard, in this case, accepting the block as, as, as something that was given by urban ordinances and, uh, and also by the, uh, um, by, by, by the, the spirit or, or the, the tradition of this part of the town, but at the same time um, inserting within this conventional gesture um, a grain, a strand of freedom. But of course this, uh, this freedom was also, was also um, uh, counterweighted with a certain return to more fundamentalist certainties and more, uh, say, ethnographic uh, figuration. Uh, these two projects here, on, on, on the left, there is this housing, this public housing for gypsies, in which the, the architect Galicia and Portela even tried to echo, uh, in such a figurative way, the sort of the, the wagons, the, the, the cars that these nomadic people normally uh, 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 travel from one part of Spain to the other. So that w whether they were made sedentary, they wouldn't lose the nomadic image of, uh, of, uh, of their cards. And, 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 and on, on the right, uh, uh, a house by, uh, by another uh, uh, Galician architect, Gallego, which also shows the image of the farm, this image of, of, uh, of um, domesticity uh, grounded in, in folklore that was then so predominant. It was dominant too in the Basque country in which the classicism was understood even as the local vernacular. And this house by Linaza Soro and, and, and Garay uh, in Mendigoria, again, um, a, a public housing, undertook this very severe, this very uh, barren brand of classicism as a way of finding their own vernacular roots. 
the 80s uh, began with some housing projects that uh, many of them were of a huge size but was, were at the same time the last housing projects of any significance. Those here are Palomeras, sort of a huge uh, housing uh, uh, working class quarters that was built at the beginning of the 80s as part of the social contract that democracy brought about. And uh, uh, this one here, which has been talked about, I think selected for you to, uh, uh, to discuss or to comment, this is this very, very um, uh, influential uh, Mollet uh, perimeter block by Boigas near Barcelona. It's a sort of a perimeter block in the midst of nowhere. It's a complete contradiction and it's almost ridiculous. But um, it was influential because it was the sort of the, the, the monumentalization of perimeter block as the uh, staple food, or as the sort of the standard receipt to build uh, uh, housing in Spain. And since then, and, and until now, all public housing has adhered to this perimeter block as the sort of uh, uh, the receipt which uh, cannot be uh, uh, um, in, in any way separated from. Although, of course, perimeter block had to, um, as its main purpose, had to create urban uh, space, and you can see what kind of urbanity this block is creating in the midst of uh, the landscape. This has been already commented on by my colleague Peter Buchanan, and this is one of the two uh, schemes by Guillermo Vázquez Consuegra. I wanted to very briefly show you, th this is this uh, Ramón and Cajal housing, in which I wanted to show how, how on the one hand, is able to transmit the, the, the crisp geometries that bring with them the promise of modernity, at the same time, be tremendously contextual and, 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 the, and, and is able to insert itself uh, behind this row that you can see here in the main, in the main street, um, therefore being, I think, uh, uh, exquisitely um, adapted to urban context and at the same time able to create through, uh, through its own uh, very, very crisp image, I think, uh, uh, um, translate sort of the <coughs> message of, of renovation that was, of course, uh, uh, evident in these images that you also saw in the Peter Buchanan uh, slides and that uh, show both uh, two, two, two images of the, same, uh, of the same facade in which the, the, the pergola is, is uh, sort of echoed by this uh, uh, upper uh, gallery that acts as a cornice of the whole building which manages to be modern and at the same time tremendously traditional in their compositional strategy. Another um, a scheme by Guillermo Vázquez Consuegra, this time in Cádiz, in which I wanted to show, um, surrounded by this huge, uh, disconcerting uh, urban mess, um, in which he, he just uh, added these three blocks, that you may think when you see them painted black there, that they are not particularly distinguished and that more or less are lost in the midst of this, uh, of this urban uh, um, um, chaos. Uh, however, when you go close to them, I think uh, they not only are, are, are able to reorder the zone considerably, but I think they are, are also capable with very uh, straight financial limits to produce housing of, of very high uh, uh, um, quality, both, uh, I think, uh, stylistically and, and spatially. And which you can also see in these images here of uh, some of the uh, galleries that connect the corridors of the two blocks that run parallel to each other. And uh, to end this uh, very, very, um, rapid and very, very um, vertiginous uh, um, way through uh, Spanish housing architecture. I'll just take two final schemes, one in Barcelona and one in Madrid. I've tried 
to balance both cities and most of the schemes you have seen are either from one or the other because this is where most <coughs> architects are and where most say influential or relevant architecture is produced. One of them is uh, Barcelona's uh, Olympic Village um, whose urban plan was drawn by Boigas that you can see here and extending the third grid and therefore I think being tremendously um, uh, say uh, conservative as far as uh, the shape of the city is concerned and I think tremendously coherent with his idea of, of uh, urban uh, tissues being uh, uh, extended as a web over the territory and uh, layer these different uh, blocks were divided between architects. I think you are studying uh, some of them. I have just selected uh, uh, one, three, three blocks which are right here, which were designed by Carlos Ferrater and built shortly, because they are the only ones with uh, a, a private, uh, which have been privately developed, and which I think are, are exemplary, because I think that uh, have managed to, to combine the respect for the extreme historicism of Boiga's plan and, um, and the needs of, of, uh, of commercial architecture, which uh, uh, they are very much to and to a very great extreme, and uh, which uh, in many senses I think uh, um, are able to take uh, the best of all the worlds. The, city understood as a connecting tissue and also the city as a, a marketing device for housing units, uh, two images of which you can also see here. And I wanted to, to uh, combine or, or to con contrast this scheme by Ferrater in Barcelona with one scheme by Oriol Boigas, sorry Oriol Boigas, uh, by uh, Sainz Oiza in Madrid by the more way and 30, which I think is, um, on the contrary, exemplary in, w in, in its uh, um, absolute lack of uh, attention to urban context or to uh, the future inhabitants of the, uh, this huge block. Being public housing and public housing for uh, very poor people, people in the sort of the lower uh, steps of, of the population, normally people living in shanty towns which are rehoused because a new more way is going to be built or something, they have very little say in the architectural proposals and Oiza managed to uh, undertake and to conduct his experiment that was uh, to um, build this huge, as you can see, um, this huge band of housing with two very different images, um, an image towards the Moroway, which you can see is very stark with this uh, small punctured uh, uh, windows in, in this uh, almost prison-like or fortress-like, uh, uh, very, very um, uh, compact and very, very, uh, I think, a sober exterior. And, and then painting rather fancifully the interior to give some excitement to the poor fellows that were expected to live there. And which you can see in, in the last uh, image uh, as, as, as uh, how this kind of schizophrenic uh, architecture uh, can only, I think, uh, uh, proceed and can only uh, survive with, with, um, with the state money, <coughs> with a lack of a client, and with, um, at the same time, with a lack of respect from the part of the architects towards the future users. Of course, for those who um, drive through the M40, the M30 in Madrid, and see the housing in the distance, it looks as a very powerful gesture. It looks as a more distinguished building anywhere in the M30. But for people who are living inside, I think the, the amenities of living and the, even the, the image of domesticity has been sacrificed to this fortress-like gesture on the uh, moral way. So therefore, contrasting as we did before, this um, fortress building on the one hand, understanding architecture's powerful images, and uh, 
this tissue, uh, this creation of tissue, this slowly weaving of the urban uh, tissue, I think that you can see in the Barcelona, uh, in the Barcelona scheme, one can very easily um, understand why uh, the, the OISA scheme in Madrid is loved by architects and hated by the inhabitants. Whereas on the contrary, most of the, Boi uh, the Boigas plan has been very much abused by their colleagues, and probably rightly, but loved by many of the inhabitants. Because it has the kind of picturesque ability to integrate and to prolong urban tissue without presenting the strong images that you can find here in Madrid. So, this is the end of the cheese, and now we come to the last part of the sandwich, sort of the, just one loaf of bread, and we'll be over. Let's have the lights on, or, or test, or whatever. So, I've, I've tried first to present briefly what I feel are some of our problems, and then to go ever so, so, uh, so rapidly, or what has been the main uh, housing architectural experiences in Spain since the Second World War. And now I want to go back to, to the future, back to what we should expect, what we should do, what, 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 uh, what is our agenda, what the issues uh, architecture should be addressing. And this I'm going to go through very briefly, again, through a short collection of slides. To begin with, um, two images I, I, I would like you to keep in the back of, uh, in the back of your head while I talk. These contradictory images, well, this is the fall of Icarus, but never mind about Icarus and look at the plow. This contradiction between agriculture and building, between the plow and the brick, between uh, culture and civilization. And, 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 and this, um, I think, tension that we must somehow must try to reconcile between architecture as uh, an image and architecture as a tissue, architecture as a web. I think that uh, if there is an agenda for architecture, it must be something in the way of uh, uh, capturing, perhaps, or, or reusing this uh, John Mayer slogan of uh, these days, this back to basics things. <laughs> Let's go back to basics, but in our own way. And uh, for instance, uh, let's again celebrate doors. Understand doors as rites of passage, as places of transit, as places of, uh, of, of uh, in, in which uh, you can change uh, a state. Let us celebrate, of course, windows, the windows which are not only places to look towards, but is the, the place where architecture meets nature, and architecture interior meets the exterior, and which are only understood when one can celebrate the sill and uh, celebrate through the human figure. Let us, let us think of floors in, 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 in a different way, not only floors as uh, geometric uh, uh, abbreviated architectures uh, as, as footprints, but floors as something that can be understood, uh, that could be a springy under your foot, and that can be understood as a tactile experience, and not only as a geometric and uh, uh, visual one. Let us then recapture fire. Fire not understood as a silent fire in a radiator, but a fire that may sing, that may bring some uh, meaning into architecture. Let us celebrate war. Uh, I, I think it was Kent who said this morning, um, the bathroom as, uh, as, as health or the bathroom as pleasure. But also there is a bathroom as uh, a place of, uh, uh, of, of, of public uh, 
encounter, uh, although I suppose it would be swimming pools today, and then the bath as something very private and intimate. Let us then be more antique. Let us be more archaic. Ken said this morning something which made me think. He said, architecture is very antique. After all, this, this building has to do with, uh, with things that take from us. And I said, well, even more than antique. Let's say, architecture is archaic. And we must, perhaps, uh, I think, uh, claim the, uh, the archaic na nature of architecture as something we shouldn't be ashamed of, but rather proud. And let us understand architecture as a place where things may happen, things may be celebrated, and not as the bleak uh, landscapes of industrial culture. After all, I think that architecture is, of course, about creating alcoves of intimacy, is about creating uh, a small inner uh, um, places where we can inhabit. But architecture is also, and we must not forget it, is the a great uh, tableau where, where, where everyday life may very unruly develop itself. We architects tend to be very, uh, I think, uh, self-reflecting, very narcissistic, and uh, I suppose that most of you are architects, or at least I'm addressing an audience of architects, and I'm aware to which extent we very often build for ourselves. Understand uh, that the business of architecture has to do with creating these places we would like to inhabit. These small alcoves of intimacy. But architecture is something we do for others. I remember I only had one, uh, one professor of housing in Madrid some 25 years ago. Now he's dead. And uh, he had a chair created for him. It was called a chair in housing, um, which was never provided after he died. And he only gave us one piece of advice, this old man, Fonseca. He said, only remember one, one thing when you design housing. Remember that you must care for those who do not have a voice. For the children, for the elderly people, for the disabled. So you needn't design for people who are young, healthy, bright, privileged, like you are. Because you'll find ways to make your voice being heard in the housing process. The worst thing is that uh, there are so many voices which are not heard and which, after all, need the architect to lend them his own voice. Architecture is also about these kind of messy things. And this is something we must never forget. I myself. Uh, must confess that I'm more and more bored with architecture and architects. And uh, I, I, I feel fatigued uh, uh, speaking to architects or writing for them. So I normally write in the newspapers or, or, or try to do things directed to different uh, constituencies. Because we feel that as a profession, we architects have become so narcissistic, so autistic, so out of touch with the real world that it's no longer worthwhile to try to rescue this, which used to be a profession of service, from this kind of, of, uh, of, of, of inner reflection of artisticity in which it has fallen in the last 20 years. So, in our agenda, I think, as I said before, that we must try to stop this dictatorship of the eye, which has upholded images as the only um, icons that architecture uh, um, is, is, is able to produce and to recapture the sense we, we, we must hear architecture and we, we must recover the sense of touch and we must recover the smell and of course taste we must recover our five senses not just as the sight after all architecture when you come down to it is about shelter. Shelter of human beings with five or more senses. And uh, when I say shelter, I'm not speaking romantically about only sheds, 
but also about cities. Let me say something of perhaps uh, only now archaeological interest. In Spain, most professionals have a patron saint, and so do architects. Our patron saint is the Holy Virgin. The Holy Virgin Mary in the flight to Egypt because she was homeless. So we have a homeless patron saint. And I very often think that uh, architects forget that our business is to provide shelter. To provide shelter for others, not to provide shelter for our own fancy. So if you let me, I'll tell you that uh, when you see this holy family in this shed, and if you look carefully through the windows that you can see amplified here, you can see I'm not yet speaking about shelter in, in this primeval hut. I'm speaking of a shelter also, as is this ideal town which uh, sort of shows through windows and which we are um, promised to inhabit, this promised Jerusalem that has been the, I think, the substance in which the heroic uh, promises of architecture were bred and which has been sadly abandoned. I think that architecture, if it, if it is to deserve its name, must dream again. Michelet said once that chaque uh, époque every time dreams of the following one. And ours is the first time that does not dream the following, that does not dream towards something. And, and I, I, I think if there is something to put into our agenda is to recover this dream and that architecture is able to dream again, to dream of the ideal town, to dream of a different way of doing things, a different way of inhabiting the earth. So dream again, have a good night, good sleep. This is all, thank you. So that's all, folks. As they say. <laughs> self-inflicted pain. Okay, I mean, you talk about this uh, primacy of uh, vision as being kind of tyrannical uh, and so on, but I mean, we have this problem. When we design something and it's just a piece of paper in front of us, I mean, sound and uh, touch and uh, smell and so on, you know, the, we can't transmit that onto paper at course first. Course and course. there's, I mean, there's perhaps something that's happening in, in the sense that uh, a lot of times now, uh, the paper, the piece of paper with the drawing on it is no longer representing a building. I mean, I mean, at least in some cases, it becomes kind of artwork for its own sake. And uh, that's another aspect of vision. But we are discussing two things. Of course, it's very difficult to represent non-visual things through drawings, of course. But it is not difficult to, to project them, to bring them. I, I put this but in the of an artwork with the people from... Uh, uh, um, trying to, they, they were sort of uh, polishing up one of the, those uh, wooden floors. And can, can, can you imagine sort of the, the tactile experience of the floor? How, how you would sort of walk on that floor and the floor would sort of, uh, uh, under your weight, sort of uh, uh, feel the presence. Can you understand architecture as a haptic experience w when you think of the floor? Of course, it may be different to represent. It is not difficult to, to imagine. It is difficult to represent and it is difficult to judge. For instance, injurious or, or 
with the students or, or in, in, in competitions, you judge people for the drawings, for the sort of for the calligraphy after all. This is true. Because we, we live under this tremendous, I think, uh, uh, I, I said dictatorship, but I said Rangurella of the eye, because it both, I think, uh, shields and protects us. Yes, okay. Ken? Okay. Well, I, I want to, uh, it, it's an interesting issue, because I think that, um, you know, actually, well, I'm jumping around, but Aldo Van Eyck today talked about this office building has 25,000 square feet of stuff, and that on the outside is the skin, and there's elevated shaft staircase. But with contempt, he speaks about the stuff. And uh, you know, in the United States, uh, a lot of market housing is controlled by the real estate industry. The real estate industry tells the architect or the building developer that the market, this is what the commodity is. You make it like that. That we know what is the market. And uh, this tendency to drive the, the, the activity to the skin, you know, which, which is a consequence of that because the architect is then reduced to the skin, is, is a kind of... Um, as a parallelism, parallelism between the, 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 the enormous concentration on graphics you know, in, the, in the competition, in the interprofessional competition of the image in order to get the job to be noticed, and the, and the market system that also is selling the, the product primarily through the skin. I mean, it also is predetermining the product. But but one of the one of the one of the kind of ironies about the market or what do people want or how do people get to want what they want is that in many cases the choice is actually less than we think it is. You know, I mean, anyway, speaking for the United States, you know, the choice is very limited in a way what the market produces spontaneously compared to well compared to Spain. So there's funny, I mean, there are funny things going on which are not so easy to analyze between, you know, what is happening to the profession with regard to images, the skin, how this is a reflection of the market and its emphasis upon, well, you architects just do the skin. We will do the rest. You know. uh, I mean, in different countries this must be in a different state, but I think there is a, a convergence here. And, and I mean, I... I I am very sympathetic to this appeal to uh, the tactile and, and uh, you know and so on, but and, and many other things you said tonight. But I think that it's not just the question of the drawing. You know, it, it's other forces in the society that I, I, I always stagger by the fact that when one looks when this issue of Dutch Forum was published and showed the drawings of Dijk, you know, those drawings are nothing. I mean. You know, the average architecture school today would throw out a student that did drawings like that. I mean, because they were... Drawings of dough, I mean. Yes. yes. You know, they were they're not, not seductive in any way whatsoever, you know. But the buildings were, uh, you know, astonishing. So this kind of funny... I think you're right in many, in many things. Sorry. But then perhaps uh, the problem of the, of the other senses is, in a way, kind of which related to rethinking new programs in... So because the, so what can in fact say that uh, in the market we can't bother about the problem anymore because the problem in a way is dictated and perhaps is dictated. Well, in, in the States anyway. In the States in a way. But of course the program is one of the, <coughs> the other, other elements in which let's say one, we one can, can get rid of this only visual element because in the program the tactile elements in fact are yeah. available. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But let me say something. On the one hand, I think it's true that uh, we live in a visual culture in which images are dominant, and that uh, things are bought and sold for images, and that TV ads sort of uh, create demand for uh, goods and so on and so forth. When I said, let us dream, I, I said, well, let's go back to basics, in the sense that uh, architecture was able not just to design skins, yeah. but to dream the future, to dream the future. But at the same time, I think that uh, most of the housing schemes in Spain I've shown have not, are not particularly dreamy. They are just, I think, 
indicative of a kind of social demand. I think they, they offer architectural, uh, um, mm -hmm. architectural images that express, I think, values, but they, not, they do not create values themselves. I think uh, the architect as a profession, I think, is expected to work within the market, to work within programs, we work within housing rules and the urban uh, criteria and try to do the best, he, the best that he can and try to express uh, what happens in his times. And you say, well, where, where, where does the sort of the critical bit come? Is he just supposed to do uh, whatever he has to do um, to the best of his ability? And I would say, the architect is also a citizen and architecture is also part of culture. Culture as a collective definition of uh, means and ends. And it's a collective as a definition of, of ideals. I think the architect as a private individual sort of working in his office is, I think, obliged to do his job the best that he can with the utmost of his ability and care and pertinence. But the architect as, as part of a collective, uh, uh, as part of a profession or as, or as a citizen, part of a of a political body is able to, to affect how values are created, how values are expressed. But I think these two roles of the architect must be separated and that individual architects are not able to create values for themselves. You could say that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, changed the image of, uh, of, 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 uh, of suburbia in America, um, but certainly it was not Frank Lloyd Wright who changed the image of suburbia. But Frank Lloyd Wright gave architectural shape to these social forces that were already present there. But I understand the, sort of the perplexity that many of these questions uh, create. And I understand when, when, when we were being shown this 25,000 square meters of rentable space as something that had been tamed, um, something which, in my opinion, is quite frankly uh, um, ridiculous. Because you manage, I don't think you have to tame dimension, you have to express dimension. And just trying to make an elephant look like a, a rat is, is completely, uh, I think, getting the wrong answers because you have asked the wrong questions. We must deal with dimension, we must deal with the market. These are things which are around us. And the, but sorry, sorry, can I... I no, no, uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's a very interesting point in the discussion because there is in your very beautiful talk critical implications. They are sometimes not uh, taken, uh, you know, you leave it to the audience to fill in the full critical consequence. But if one compares the Science de Oysa uh, fortress to the Ferreter primitive block, there is a, a discourse here about value. I mean, you can say, well, that perimeter block is built for upper middle class uh, 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 bus Exactly. Which it is. Uh, but uh, it doesn't follow from that logically that the, the workers on the uh, outer periphery of Madrid have to be put into that fortress. And yet that fortress is very seductive in terms of its plastic uh, and all that stuff, right? It is seductive. Well, I think you do. You even do. And, uh, and, and uh, what is sort of alarming is that when you get there, you realize how empty it is. You know? I mean, not only for the people who live there, but even as a visitor, you feel its emptiness when you finally get there. You know? and, uh, and then there is a kind of, I mean, within the profession, there is a value issue to be. <coughs> Values, can, in that sense, can be created <coughs> by the profession, though, by critic, architect, architect. Otherwise, I mean, I mean, the dangerous thing today is, is this kind of value-free climate in which, in the end, you know, it's pluralist and we can't discuss it's your, your view against my view. But there are things to be touched here, I think. Don't you agree? But let me say something about the M30 block, for instance. I think and it's a, a despotic, extravagant gesture, a beautiful one, and therefore something to be criticized. Because the client is the people who are driving in the motorway, not the people who are going to live there. Sure. It's not understood as, 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 a, as something that must enhance life, but just an image on 
today's uh, uh, um, public space, which is the modern way. There is no more public space, there is no more square than the modern way. Everybody sort of drives around it, and the images on the modern way are sort of the, the, the images that we all talk about. TV and sort of big modern ways are the, the squares where opinion is created and where images are, are, are pushed to the fore to promote things. Can I say something about the M30? Sorry, because actually I couldn't find slides. That's why I thought of starting about the public and private, because the M30 is a disastrous public housing scheme. As a private sector scheme, if they charged enough, and if the middle had a miniature golf course, a swimming pool, and so on, it would, be, it would make a fortune as a private sector scheme. People would clamor to get in if it was expensive enough. I'm absolutely certain of that, because that is the private sector. It's a defensive kind of realm. And I think that it's very clear there. I mean, you, could you are mistaken. I'll tell you why. <laughs> uh, uh, just a moment. I'll, I'll ask first Peter, and then I'll ask. Peter is mistaken. Why? I, uh, why, why I say so with such sort of, uh, I'm being very, very sort of uh, overpowering. He's mistaken. Because the M30 is filled with private housing schemes. Dozens of them, and all of them, have sort of the main, the, the, the main pieces of the house looking towards the more way. Because there is the demand of those who buy houses in the modern way to see this huge flow of cars passing in front of the windows. This kind of uh, inner looking uh, building would be rejected by the private market. And this is not something I forecast. This is something I say on the experience of, uh, say, 50 other schemes along the modern way. The, the, the OESA scheme is so beautiful because it's the only one that looks introverted from the modern way. It looks like an old fortress there, whereas the rest of them are full of the usual sort of crap, sort of the small windows and uh, uh, full, of, full of this fragmentation of domesticity <coughs> opening to them. But this has the sort of the, the great monumental power of, of, uh, of, of fortresses or uh, public architecture. It is public architecture on a big moral way, whereas the rest of the schemes around it are private architecture with no sense of the monument. They don't want to be there. They don't want to, to be seen from the Moroi as something significant. They don't aspire at being significant, but just at being comfortable and being able to look at this huge flow of cars from your drawing room. <laughs> Sorry, I will. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to add a little masochistic detail. Uh, okay. The we are all in masochistic mood tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like to make a um, About the context here, uh, during the Aldo van Eyck meeting and session, and now, now we are talking towards the projection wall, with you sometimes, but we turn our back mostly towards others. So we are sitting back to back, and the afternoon, the, the chairs were in very deep circles, so we were facing each other, and we could look there, and we could look here. We could look at that projection wall while we were sitting like this and see each other, and we would be shaping social forces. We would be shaping the force of our dialogue. It Absolutely. You are quite right. Okay. The the Van Eyck thing was a social occasion, so everybody was looking at each other because it was here in Aldo Van Eyck was as important as having a look at everybody else. And now this is understood as a more sort of uh, say Did teaching I or the, or and I try to break that by sort of walking through the corridor. Like, so that you can sort of raising your sense of centrality. That's the point I wanted to of say. Course. I like to this this when I walk there I try to raise my get to the sort of the social uh, uh, space that uh, Aldo Van Eyck had I think this is the good moment to end this discussion. <laughs> we take oh, there is no Come on tomorrow, We will go on. We will have another job. I, I understand this, uh, this uh, idea of a return to the basics. What I don't really understand is why this return has to be archaic or antique and not modern. I want to, I want to return to the basics. Archaic is, is, is just 
to yes, sort but, of a, but you a provocative way of putting it. Well, I, I think we are I'm very provoc- modern being very archaic. I'm being a provocative too, but you didn't use the word modern. Did I use the, the, the you word modern? You didn't use the word modern. I did. Didn't I? No. <laughs> <laughs> then if I didn't, I apologize and I use it now. So I said that being very archaic, we are very modern. Okay. But using the word modern or contemporary mixed with the other one, you could lose rhetorical uh, significance. But uh, this is why I didn't use it. I yes. have a very similar question, but uh, I agree to your agenda to understand the human sensitivity and abilities and all other senses. But I don't think we all know that uh, some knows that we have five senses, something that they could be 11 or some things much more. Or did we really try the modern way to understand the human being? Or what I'm asking is that how would you elaborate your agenda further? Because to be sensitive is not only the answer. To know these five senses is not only the answer. We are far more modern, and now we can see the human being far more deeper. We, we, we don't confront the being, in a way. That's my thought. Oh, you're quite right. I, I use the five senses and mirror sort of uh, conventional device, and, uh, but, but by that I meant not just uh, let's smell everything and, and, and let's take sort of the, the, the carpet. What I meant was rather let us understand architecture in a less visual way, let us not be captured by images and manipulated by them, let us try to go behind the images, sort of peel the images from the body of architecture and so look at this real face. That sometimes, as you say, is in a spiritual phase, in which this no, kind I'm of... I'm not talking about spiritualism or something, I'm talking about understanding the human being in a sense sensitive and a modern way with our knowledge, which we don't really do it till now. That's why maybe things are going wrong by again and again. So we, we just took it as granted in a way. So maybe things can emerge further on and things like tectonics could base them really to it, not just... Uh, no, indeed. No, no, indeed, you are right. But when when I mentioned tectonics, uh, sort of uh, taking this word that uh, uh, Ken uses so so often, I, I, or perhaps too often, uh, although with the textile sort of bit is is sort of the softening it rather. But w- when I use that, what, what I meant to say is, uh, architecture is about geometry in building, and and this is something we also tend to forget. I also spoke about the senses, but I also spoke about this going back to basic geometry and the basic building, which we very often think that as everything is buildable, today everything is buildable, but everything is buildable does not mean that everything is cheap, or reasonable, or, 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 or able to, to be produced without, uh, uh, um, say, uh, sort of stressing the, the, the inner nature of architecture. For instance, the square angle. This uh, three-dimensional uh, bit that we have in the inner ear and through which we don't fall to the floor. I believe that we have straight angles inside our body and therefore the, uh, the straight angle is rather reasonable. And the, why all architecture nowadays uh, considers uh, straight angles a sort of a, a dirty, a formalistic trait? Uh, l- let us go back to the straight angle because it's so convenient. And we have uh, our axis of coordinates in the inner ear. So there are some basic biological truths that we must see again and again. Things like, uh, for instance, uh, the gravity points uh, perpendicularly to the floor. And that if uh, floors are flat, are more convenient to walk, or things of the sort. This, this, this kind of, of uh, obvious uh, character of architecture must be remembered and be reminded to others again and again, because we are living in such a sort of a wealth of, of uh, formal, uh, um, overpowering. Uh, richness of, of, uh, of shapes that uh, suddenly I think is refreshing to say that some of them are more important than others. In 90 degrees is more important than 84, say. Much more important. I will defend that. This is what I call back to basics. 
No, I, I I'm still stuck to my point. What I'm saying that this back to basic is understood. We know it. But when you say the, the spiritual things, I mean, if I want to understand my inner self, this science, this technology, this modernity, this whole process of history should help me to understand the inner self very precisely. And we don't then call it that as spiritualism. It is as normal as feeling of gravity. Why do we say that it is something mystic? No, I don't think I, I We did. should then, maybe okay. then we have more... Uh, no, I just, what I only sort of uh, touched upon that when what I said, instead of creating alcoves of intimacy, let's create a scenarios for the development of a rather unruly public life in which uh, people very different from ourselves are going to inhabit. Uh, let, let's think of the others, which are not ourselves. So, I think we have a very small moment where we should stop certain things. Because it's in it's a way, very early. It's not so early. I want to stop this meeting for today. It has been a very long day with many activities. And I hope to see you back tomorrow evening for the guests and for all the participants. It will be 10 o'clock in the morning. Then we will meet the masochism continue. continue.